Well, I believe that begins our official uh, uh, jump off to the, the breakout sessions for this year's 2021 Safety and Resiliency Conference. So thank you very much for coming through. Um, want to recognize too, if you are if we're able to, to hear the opening plenary speaker um, and, and you need anything, please take care of yourself. Um, this, is, this, is, this is heart and, and mind work. So um, if you need water to turn your cameras off, do, do what you need to do for the time being. Uh, the preference will be to, to have our cameras on. This is going to be a conversation. I'm very, very thankful to have Trisha Lofton, Hugh Lester Douglas, and Jose Alfredo Hernandez here to share their expertise and time um, from, from their lived experiences. Um, so the overview, this conversation came into Genesis through a conversation that Alfredo and I had uh, regarding what is the role that men play in ending domestic sexual violence, stalking, any form of oppression, uh, excuse me, any form of gender-based violence. Um, and in, in my role, I, I work at the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. So I, I'm not on the ground per se, working with offenders, nor are I an advocate of people who've experienced violence. But I really appreciate this opportunity in, in Alfredo's genesis of, a, of an idea to what would it be if in community conversations we were linking in uh, offender intervention programs and advocates, um, if that maybe is happening around the state that we don't know about, we'd love to hear. Um, but also this is an invitation to a conversation about building community within your geographic community, um, certainly between or offices and organizations and whatever role you play um, in, in the, the idea of healing and helping make our, our community safer. Um, so that's our intention for the day. Um, I'd love to have our panel members introduce themselves um, briefly. And so panelists, three things. Who are you today? What's one thing that energizes you? And then your organization and the role that you play. So I'd love to start off with you, Lester, then to Tricia, and then Alfredo. And then we'll, we'll move on after that. You, Lester? Yes. Good morning to everyone. As noted there on the screen, I'm you, Lester Douglas. I am the associate director of an organization based in Atlanta called Men Stopping Violence. Um, what energizes me is going to the park, being on the outdoors. Like yes, or actually not yesterday, but Sunday, for example, just being in Piedmont Park, which is one of the major parks here in Atlanta, seeing people moving around, got a lot of energy from that. Fantastic. Thank you, Lester. Trisha, do you mind? I am Trisha Lofton. Good morning. I'm going to apologize. I have a sinus infection, so I'm a little bit stuffy. Um, but what energizes me is my grandkids. I have seven, soon to be eight. Um, and I am the operations director at Advocates Against Family Violence in Caldwell. And I've been here for about 16 years. Thank you, Trisha. Alfredo? Uh, my name is Jose Alfredo Hernandez, and I um, am doing well today and uh, really grateful for the opportunity to be here uh, with a lot of colleagues that I see on the screen. So really good to see you all. Hope you all had a great Memorial uh, Day weekend, uh, some time with your friends and your families uh, and yourself. Uh, I think the thing that energizes me um, is a really good book. Uh, I'm a big um, reader and I love to uh, stay informed and uh, love to be inspired and motivated. And so uh, a good book um, is what really energizes me. And I'm the program supervisor uh, at what was formerly known as a new path. We are now Trivium Life Services and we are an offender intervention program. Uh, and so I am the current director uh, for that. I uh, appreciate uh, again the opportunity to be here with you all. Thank you all for, for sharing a bit. Um, so for our time today, um, we were hoping to, to discuss the intersections between offender intervention programs and advocacy programs and have a conversation from, from folks in the field, from our experts, um, or what are some of the barriers and strategies and you all as experts in your own, in your field, in your communities, if there are any barriers or strategies that you are using, we'd love to have them in the chat. Um, 
going to kind of begin share time through story and personal connections around ways that we can maybe build examples of how relationships can develop this work because we know at the end of the day this is about relationships and so through some of the planning conversations um you lester and trisha and alfredo have all shared of how relationships play a part in, in in building not only their own content relationships but also if we're looking to to share ahead with how we're going to help heal people who have been harmed in our communities and then maybe move towards even violence prevention um, so for our time together uh, we'd love for you to to access your handout that, that was shared um, in the in the conference website uh, this is the these are the touchstone practices and these were shared with us um, from the Circle of Trust Institute. Um, so briefly, uh, these are something we utilize, again, rather than make these mandatory, just the idea about how can we show up in a space um, in, in the tension of building relationship. So the idea about give and receive welcome. Uh, the second one is all of you is welcome here. For me, this one always tips and usually I don't sleep well and I, our little people are elementary school age, so I am frantic all the time until I get to work. And then how do I make that pause? So just for myself, knowing that, that however you all are showing up today, you are welcome. Third one being speak your truths in ways that respect the truths of others. So the idea if you have questions, curiosities, please, please put them in. Um, just encourage you all to come from a space of love and curiosity. Um, and that leads into the fourth one of turning to wonder when you have something that comes up for you in asking those questions coming from love and curiosity. And last one is how can we flex that muscle of learning to respond to others with honest and open questions. Um, our conversation may spurn some things for you today, may question how you do things. Um, so we invite you to turn to these touchstone practices um, as you are responding either in the chat or uh, unmuting and having a comment conversation. So today, I, I don't know, uh, we have a poll question. And uh, Christine, would that be possible to put that poll question in into the space right now? Yes, absolutely. I will put it, uh, the first one I'll bring into the chat right now. All right, thank you. So if you would be willing to, we have one question that is a, a choose a selection, and then we have two more that we'd love to have your responses be in the chat box. Um, full transparency. Uh, I thought we could do it and we can't. So I made a mistake and we're gonna, we're gonna adjust to, to, to accommodate. So um, this first poll question, if you don't mind responding. Thank you, Christine. And the question is how often do you work with an advocacy program or uh, offender intervention program? Thank you, Gabrielle. Oh, thanks for the question, Christine. Advocacy program in this end, um, in our planning, we were speaking specifically to domestic or sexual violence uh, community-based programs. Who were providing services to folks who were harmed and seeking those services. Thank you all for the 81 folks who put your voice in the room so often. My goodness, over 63% of the times, um, folks are working with 12 times or more per year. Um, and then it decreases significantly, looking at uh, close to 31%, go four times or less a year. So thank you all very much for sharing. So it sounds like already there's a lot of movement and connection within within you all from your communities of working either from your advocacy role or into your offender intervention program. Um, so thank you. Um, so the second and third questions, Christine, do you mind loading those possibly into the chat? Not at all. It'll be there momentarily. Thank you. So appreciate you all being flexible with my work around. Uh, the second and third questions will be in the chat momentarily. And if you don't mind popping in your responses, we'd love to hear 
what your experience has been. Thank you, Christine. So the first one being how would working with an advocacy or community offender intervention program benefit the work you do? You see with 63% of y'all already doing it. So how does being in a relationship benefit the work that you do? Maybe that would be the shift for the majority of the folks on the call. You don't mind putting in things into the chat to share with us, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you, Kathy. Survivors with resources and safety. Um, Patty, increasing victim safety and support for families. Thank you, Dusty. Pe keeps people in connection for resources and awareness. Enhancing personal skills. A lot going on that you all are already doing in the benefit of being in relationships. Um, Yeah, as we as we often find out, there's a ton of knowledge already in the room with what you all are showing up for. Um, so thank you um, for what you're putting in, because we know that by sharing information, you are giving permission for the rest of us to consider ways that have been working for you within your community and the folks that you work with. So thank you. And I believe the chat will be up for the entirety of, of our session. So if there's some things on there if you want to cut and paste to put into a Word doc or just find some things to come back to, it's, it's there for you. Um, really appreciate you all having um, all these, these comments to put in here. And thank you, Susan Manley, about having more, missing out on having these kind of conversations. So uh, as I've learned from my friend Alfredo, we are built for connection and communication. So this time together, be it on Zoom, we're here for this. And so if you all don't mind, I'd love to dip into to kind of the questions we had prepared um, and, and kind of get some thoughts from, from our panelist members. Um, so I don't have any kind of expectations, but Tricia, you, Lester, Alfredo, you know, please speak when it, when it comes to you. But, um, one of our first questions, I guess we'd like to explore is, um, what may exist for you all? What are some of the, what have been some of the barriers that you believe? have existed between um, you know, offender intervention, community intervention programming, and advocacy work. Y'all wouldn't mind sharing with us things that you've As done. we're um, having those replies come in, just a little bit of background uh, in regards to the thought process here and kind of um, why we're doing this. Uh, so I have been doing this for the last eight, nine years, um, and I got into uh, this work um, Accidentally, I wasn't looking to do this work. I wasn't passionate about this work. Uh, it was in response to something that took place in my family and having uh, to do a second job, actually. Uh, and the second job was doing this domestic violence work. And as I, you know, sat in that classroom uh, and was learning how to do this work, uh, I came to understand very quickly, oh, you got your own work to do. Um, and I think that was real um, eye opener for me personally, right? And then also has been a driving force uh, in the eight years that I've been doing this work that we're all in the soup together. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we need to continue to work on, uh, both the individuals in our group rooms um, and, uh, you know, the individual teaching in front of the group room, right? Uh, so being mindful and aware of those things. But I remember attending my first conference and my program supervisor at the time uh, telling me, hey, you probably don't want to you know, tell too many people what you're doing or, or how you're doing it. And I was kind of taken aback by that comment to say, well, I don't understand, right? Well, and he said, well, you're gonna find out that you know, people who work on this side of the fence with offenders, you know, uh, we're not seen favorably. Uh, and I, you know, I said, okay, that's fine. Didn't think much of it. Uh, attended my first conference, super excited, super excited about the work uh, that I was doing. And I ran into a colleague of mine from my previous career doing HIV work. Um, and she was uh, an advocate in the community, 
uh, was a director of a homeless shelter uh, back in the day um, and dealt with a lot of uh, individuals who were uh, victims slash survivors of domestic violence. And she said, oh, Alfredo, good to see you. Good to see you. And, you know, what are you doing now? And I told her I'm working with offenders. And she said, oh, you're one of them. And it was my first like, oh, this is real, right? This is what uh, my mentor was talking about. And um, from that moment on, I've had the thought of, we have to figure out how to one, talk about that, you know, deal with that and move forward from it because we're here for the same purpose, which is to, you know, end domestic violence uh, end gender-based violence, sexual assaults and all those things. And we're working it from two different point endpoints, right? But we're all here for the same purpose. And how do we get to a point where we're really talking to one another uh, and learning of what the other is doing so that we can be of support uh, to the other, um, you know, entities and what they're trying to accomplish and bring those into our programs and vice versa. I think that they need to know what we're trying to accomplish, how we're trying to do that. Um, and to, again, not lose sight of the purpose in regards to keeping people safe and being able to hear those stories uh, like the one we heard this morning um, and that was my question that I posed to her if this individual had come into our programs what would you want what would the expectations be what's our capacity to meet those expectations or those desires um, and so that's kind of what we've been talking about in these roundtable sessions for these last you know handful of years and then most recently uh, was part of a round table in District 3 about, hey, what's going on and, you know, what can we do better and what's kind of the um, state of affairs currently. And it just, for me, what I see is the clients that we work with, whether they're be in my program or a program like mine or they're in Trisha's uh, program or a program like Trisha's, the reality is that so many of those individuals end up staying in relationship, whether we like it or not whether we agree with it or not, the reality is so many of these uh, individuals end up back in relationship. And if one isn't aware of what the other is doing or what's trying to be done and have some kind of understanding or foundation to kind of stand upon and evaluate that relationship, evaluate the changes, uh, support you know, what's going on, you know, throughout the course of the relationship, I think it's really hard for individuals to survive in those relationships. And then we end up seeing people back in our programs. So for me, it was just like, how do I make stronger connections um, with the victim advocates in our community, bolster the practices that I'm doing or supposed to be doing with my program as we reach out to individuals? And how do we recognize that we are, you know, here for the same reasons and the same purpose? Uh, not for the purpose that was originally introduced to me. Oh, you exist to make a, offenders better offenders, right? Um, and so, yeah, that was really kind of the the basis and the genesis of um, this today. And, and you know, Amber Mo taking notice um, of that um, feedback and and making a suggestion about, hey, how do we maybe open this up and do a conversational piece with other people who are involved? and see where we're at, see where we intersect. Um, and like we were talking about, what's the barriers uh, that keep us from having that collaboration and what are the strategies for us moving into that collaboration and then moving beyond maybe some of the work that we're doing now to get out in front as compared to waiting for people to come into our program. I think what uh, our keynote speaker said today if she wished before that crime that that individual would have gotten the most help you possibly can. And so again, trying to work upstream as compared to waiting for people to have done something already and then end up in our programs. So that's kind of where I'm at uh, with this and wanted to share that with you all. I'll, I'll go. Um... To that question, Jeff, I think what com comes to mind for me is that this illuminates some of the, the history, as at least as I understand it, in terms of um, the movement and where we are today. I mean, the reality is that this work was begun by, by women and um, who were certainly concerned about women's safety and what they were seeing and so on and so on. And there aren't many men 
present and around. And then over the years, um, we and again, I'm working from the, the position, this may not be the case in Idaho, that most of the offender intervention programs are the, the students, the participants are men. So that's the place I'm coming from that suddenly locally and across the country, these intervention programs were popping up. And I think it brought into focus, as I understand that the realities of gender, a lot of gender relations. Um, the context here is that most of these acts of violence are committed by men against, I mean, towards women. Um, no matter our analysis, I think most of us can reasonably conclude that there is, it is gendered. There's something specific here about um, male violence against women that need, 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 need to be addressed. And so when you have intervention programs propping up, um, what I've learned over the years is that there's, I believe to me, a very healthy distrust by, by bad women, women advocates about what it is that's going on, quote unquote, over there. It's like, what are those programs doing with those men? Can we really trust those programs to center victim survivors experience and hold women's voices central, even if it's just all men in the room, which is the case here in, in Atlanta, is that at our program, we call them instructors, facilitators are exclusively men. Um, and so it makes sense to us that a lot of advocates are going, hey, what is going on over there? We're, we're apparently working in the interest of, 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 of women. Can we trust those men to uphold women's voices? So I think there is, for me, a healthy distrust by many um, women's advocates about these intervention programs. Uh, because again, it brings into stark focus the realities of structural inequality, of sexism, of patriarchy. In, in the context of intimate partner violence, I mean, that is a very clear example of patriarchy in motion, you know, male violence against women in, 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 that, in, that, in that space. And so that tension, as I understand it, ex exists today, you know, a lot of that distrust and can you hold up women's interest and so on. And I think rightfully so. So part of um, a solution, I know this would come later, is the willingness, I think, for offender intervention programs to listen to women advocates, to imagine the idea of taking leadership from women, because that's one of the tensions. Hey, we're working with the men, and mostly predominantly men, and we are men and we know men. And the idea of listening to advocates, you know, for direction about how those programs even should be conducted. A lot of intervention programs don't think very differently, especially if uh, because of the professionalization of the movement, especially if it's an advocate who don't have quote unquote, the credentials, there is a dismissing of women's voices by offender intervention programs that I think create that kind of barrier and tension that I think needs to be um, addressed. addressed. Thank you. Uh, so we had a question come through on my end uh, along the lines of what you were talking about, which is how can offender intervention programs then take the lead from those who are most likely to be impacted by violence? I'll give some examples of how we address that. And again, I know there's a later question that is going to be on the table, but part of what I think has made at least men stopping violence have a generally very good relationship with advocacy programs here in the Atlanta metro area is that our program was founded by a battered women advocate who was well-respected in the field back in 1980 to Kathleen Carlin. So she worked both locally and nationally. And so program that served, you know, that were there to meet the needs of women, victims, survivors, began to trust, you know, Men Stopping Violence because of Kathleen's presence as the director of a program that was engaging with men. So from the start, it's like here's a, a battered women advocate activist who worked in shelters for many, many years in Cobb County, Georgia. And she's not leading up a program that is focused primarily on working with offenders. So it was a built-in tr uh, trust. So we got a lot of our cultural space, pretty much very victim-centered culturally. Caffeine really, in, you know, make sure the men working at Men's Stopping Violence are clear about, you know, about that. So a couple of things we've done. Record the sessions. 
because Kathleen, th can you hear me already still? It's okay. Um, uh, Kathleen thought it was really critical that, that this is true for every program that male facilitators be on the front line dealing with men. Her belief is that women in her, this organization need to be more in supervisory positions for men to get direction from. Women supervise, men are on the front line. She thought all that hostility that comes with women in the room, let men <laughs> deal with it, but that we need to be accountable to women. And so we recorded the sessions and um, there were a number of battered women advocates who volunteered to listen to sessions and gave us feedback about how it's going that we're really holding victim survivors' interests central to the work we do. So there was a built-in accountability. Sometime, a number of women advocates sat in the class on the outside of the circle at their, their desire and observed the class. We welcomed that and, that is, and then met with us to give us feedback about what they're observing. So those are two examples. And there's ongoing supervision by women about the work we do. And the, the belief there is that we are men. And as conscious as we are, about the concerns of in, women survivors, we cannot fully know that experience that can only come back, at, at least from our point of view, from women, women who are gonna see what we don't see and offer those insights. And it's our responsibility to listen and um, oftentimes make adjustments in what we do. So some of those are some of the things we, we do and have done. Thank you, Lester. Uh, appreciate that. And then that question was great. So thank you. If you have other questions, please continue to put them in the chat. Um, Patricia, I'm curious if you might going back even to the, the prompt question about potential the barriers that have existed between y'all or for you in the work that you've done in working with survivors of violence. Um, I'm going to apologize. The lawnmower is going by the window. Always timing. It's been we silent until right now. Okay, I didn't hear the end of your question, Jeff, sorry. Oh, no need. Um, the, 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 the question about maybe some barriers that have existed for you um, in your work and working with survivors of violence and potential like OIP or offender intervention programs in the community. One of the things I talked to um, a couple of the advocates about this before uh, today's session and I asked them their thoughts as well. And one of the things that, that they mentioned was that um, it was great that everybody um, connects and is on the same page and, and knows what everybody's teaching. But one of the fears that they had was that, um, and what Alfredo said is absolutely correct, a lot of our families are gonna be back together. Um, but when they separate again, or if there's another incident, the survivor, um, might have a lack of trust of going back to that agency, knowing that they'd had that conversation or that working relationship with the offender intervention program. You know, that was a fear that survivors would think, oh, well, they were talking with the facilitator of my husband or significant others group before, what if they, you know, have that conversation again? Um, and, and a lot of that was, you know, fear, but I know one of the things that we talked about, you know, in planning this is even just some simple things that, um, that programs could do, uh, just as baby steps is, you know, one of the things is as simple as a parent, the parenting class, you know, if we have people taking parent families, taking parenting classes, and that's part of, um, offender intervention, and it's also part of maybe the victim services, if they're teaching two separate parenting classes and they end up back together, they're still not on the same page. They've, they've literally gone through two classes that are not on the same page. And so that in itself can create some more struggles for families that are going to be back together. Um, you know, I think it, it really is going to be, um, uh, difficult at times um, to work with different programs because, and I saw some people posted in the chat, um, territories, you know, people feel like they're stepping on other people's toes. But I think if we're really working for the families and we want everybody um, to receive the best service, you know, if we all can kind of agree 
what is best practice and what is the parenting class or what is the 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 goal across the board and not just with offender intervention we're talking about child protection cases we're talking about um, probation and parole we're talking about treatment providers mental health providers you know we have families that have um a laundry list of things when they move into shelter that they have to do um, from outside agencies that are requiring those, whether that be again, child protection, probation. And we have, you know, nobody's really talking to anybody. And so you have people asking families to do things that it's not possible. You can't attend four parenting classes. This agency wants this person to do this. This agency wants this person to do this. And, and all of these different things come together. And then offender interventions kind of out here as the, uh, what did Alfredo said, you're one of those people. Um, and they're doing a laundry list of other things. So I think really just communicating with each other with the programs themselves, not necessarily on cases specific, but just as, the the program specifically kind of working together to create this wraparound service for families so if they are going to be back together you know they've all received the best practice they've they've been given the tools to move forward and you know make their families healthier versus uh tools from 45 toolboxes that really don't uh join together Thank you. Thank you all. Um, just want to open it up. Is there something that, that one of the panelists shared that you wanted to expand on or share, connect to? Um, I, on oh, that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, go was, ahead. I was just going to say um, I'm with the CASA program, uh, CASA of Southwest Idaho. And we find ourselves um, in a position often when these cases are also child protection cases um, of trying to, to um, keep that duplication of services um, from, from happening um, and making sure at the same time that everyone is receiving sort of best practice interventions. Um, but like you said, they, they're often uh, are overscheduled um, so they do have two or three parenting classes or things that just time and transportation and, and brain power doesn't allow to really happen. Um, so I see that as a significant issue and I, and we're trying to do our part to, to make it possible for people to get the information and healing that they need, but I'm not sure if there's somebody else out there trying to do that as well, especially on cases that are not child protection related. Thank you. Alfredo? Well, I want to uh, plus one what Tricia was saying and, and kind of get to that first bullet that we were talking about in regards to and explore the intersect between what we do uh, and what victim advocacy programs. And, you know, obviously the obvious intersect is the, the violence, right? Uh, the violence that's done by the uh, individuals in our program and the violence that's experienced by the individuals uh, in Trisha's program uh, or in programs like Trisha. But what I'm also hearing, right, is that not only are we dealing with this, you know, violence, but uh, so many of the isms as well, right? Uh, the sexism, the racism, uh, the notion of poverty, the notion of housing. Um, and so all these things that we're trying to account for um, because we know that, hey, listen, knowledge is power, but knowledge, one, has to be applied. How do we move from theory to action? Uh, but then also thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of need, if we can't get people past those first two rungs on the ladder, the ability for them to self-actualize the information that they're getting and to apply that and to learn from it, to grow from it, becomes very difficult to do. Uh, the first thing that goes offline is the very thing that we're trying to change, which is the cognition, the cognitive part of the brain. If we can't address these kind of bottom rung issues as a community of providers, uh, with this population that we're working in, I think it's going to be really difficult. So really understanding how we intersect on all these different levels and how we can be, again, of assistance to one another uh, and aware of those things 
uh, and to work together and trying to address those things. One of the, my most recent experiences uh, is working with the Pocatello uh, domestic violence court community. Um, and one of the things that I really have taken notice of and has really stuck out to me is the way that they've done uh, their court review hearings um, and that whole process. Uh, you know, part of what they've done is when we do a court review, um, there's a staff of us, right, including the offender intervention, the victim advocates, uh, the attorneys on opposing sides being present, and us being able to discuss, hey man, what's going on, uh, and knowing from other points of view how the individual in front of us is doing, because it's really easy, right, to get kind of a really limited perspective or limited point of view in regards to your work with the individual. But unless you're a fly on the wall, you don't know what they're doing outside your building. You don't know what they're doing outside your program. And, and, and so that relationship with other people involved become very critical for us to do. And I think the barriers for us to be able to do that is one, just the I don't know about you all, but I don't have very much time to lift my nose from the grindstone very often, right? To take, you know, a breath and step back and look up and say, hey, what are my peoples doing, right? That are all involved in this work. And, you know, what's the intersect with this individual who's in front of me so that I can be better informed in regards to the work that I'm doing with a person who is sitting there in my program. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of want to just touch base on that and what Tricia was saying, that there's just these so many ways that, you um, we intersect it. We need to be aware of those things and be able to then, of course, try to address some of those barriers so that we have a better um, communication. Something that uh, a colleague that we we're hoping to bring on today, but we weren't able to, her name is Carmen uh, Petrie. I'm not sure if I said that right, P-I-T-R-E. She's a president and CEO of the Sojourner, Sojourner Family Peace Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then one of the things that she said is, <sighs> We were hoping to have her as a panel, uh, a panelist, and she said, in terms of comments that she was going to make, I was going to talk about the importance of developing a strong relationship with your local domestic violence provider. We do training, wellness sessions, and team meetings with our local batter training providers. The deeper the relationship, the better the work. And for me, that really stood out, right? Because the very thing that we're trying to address in our programs is the notion of relationship understanding that you know um, everything about us from head to toe is for the purpose of relationship. And within that relationship, we get that brain development and that brain development kind of really drives the path forward in regard to people's behavior, right? And so that we know that those early relationships are very powerful and when they're not good, we have the ripple effect. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to help people re-understand those relationships, right? To trust the very thing that they've come to distrust the most. But we know, right, from uh, the Harvard 80-year study that the best predictor of well-being and happiness, whether that be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, intuitive, is the quality and depth of relationship. I think that applies to our communities as well. Uh, and our idea of community of providers, that if we want to save community, that we want a community that's well connected, we have to have quality and depth in relationship with one another. So how do we start cultivating those kinds of things uh, and allow us to move forward collectively in order to address this issue that we've been dealing with for quite some time now? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Lester, I see if you're unmuted. Would you like to add? Yeah. Yeah, just to pick up on, on, on Alfredo's point, and I think part of what allowed for those um, conversations and connections was being in the room, having some very difficult conversations about gender and power differentials, race, all those things. I think that's what I was getting at primarily in my earlier comments that some may call it, quote unquote, the elephant in the, in the, in the room. Uh, I think a lot of folks like to use that analogy. But the idea that, 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 that the tension, as I understand it, listening to many advocates, is, is, the, is a gendered tension, an intersectional tension of structural inequality that is showing up and that um, advocates and offender intervention program folks get in the room talking about um, those differences I think really matter. So for example, again, here in the Atlanta metro area, because we are an organization working primarily with men, 
part of the ways the sexism is showing up is that we've gotten certainly much more attention, right? When the media wants to, there's an issue in, 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 in the news about a man who committed an act of violence, murder, whatever, they call in men stopping violence. They don't call the women's resource center to end domestic violence um, because in part, yeah, we work with men, but there is a sexist part of that too, that men serve in organizations no better. That is more important what men are doing. That's the kind of reality and, te and tension that I'm, I think a lot of folks want to talk about. Um, but we've had those difficult conversations between our, 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 our shelters and men stopping violence. That example I just gave about me, the difference. So that created some real tension and we worked out, I'll say more, about the relationship and how we build it when we get to that place. But yeah, get into the room and get in, getting down about some of the realities, some of the difficulties. I'm kind of curious about um, that process. So I understand, uh, Ulester, that your program has some history behind it. You've been doing this for quite some time. Um, and what was that evolution to get to that place? Um, and, and what was the, you know, how much time did that take to kind of get there where you're having these kind of conversations, where you're having this kind of structure within your programs? I'm eight years old in the field, and there's some of you who've been here for quite some time. My colleague, Joe Toms, I see is on here. Uh, I see Pete Bruno that's on here. I see people that have been doing, Mr. Scott Miller that's on here, that have been doing this work for quite some time. And maybe they're seeing something different. But, um, you know, I'm only eight years old in this, but you know, have we had these kinds of conversations? Is that's what's next for us in regards to, um, you know, the uh, the people above us who give us permission to do this work in regards to taking, you know, their um, input from this and saying, okay, sounds like we need to kind of have these round tables or sounds like we have to kind of get together in these rooms as OIPs and as victim advocates to say, hey, what's going on? Where are you at? What's coming up for you feeling wise? What do you know about each other? And how do we really start to strengthen that relationship? Because I do believe um, in that tension, right, is the future work that's needed um, and the binding force that allows us to continue doing this work together moving forward and really hopefully making some big differences in our community, right? So I would be really interested from some of those individuals who've been doing this for a lot longer, what had you noticed in regards to um, these working partnerships and these kinds of discussions? Have we had them? Have we not had them? Do we need to have them again? I see Ms. Amber Moe. Hey, Alfredo, it's good to see you. Hello, hello, good to see you. <laughs> so, uh I would just go back to when are the opportunities for us to come together and talk about that? You know, we do these at round tables. We do it at a training here and there. I mean, you guys have all been with me for many years and we, we bring the topic up, what, every five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then the topic kind of goes away. And I, <laughs> um, and so I think I'm at a point where we need to have more than just a round table discussion about how we can collaborate better right? Um, we need to start having that be a part of our daily work. We need to start coming together more often and learning about what each other are doing, what our services are. And when I say we, I mean offender programs and victim services and advocates within the community. You need to be reaching out to each other and learning what is your advocate agency offering? What are the classes? What is the parenting class they are offering? You know, what are all the services they are offering? And victim services need to learn the same from event offender programs. You know, come sit in and on class. You know, have meetings together. Start having discussions, even if they're not about specific families and individuals, because we all understand the confidentiality around that. We all understand that piece of it. But just start having some discussions versus, you know, um, once you know every five years in a training or at these round tables like i think we just need to we need to another step in that discussion i don't know what that looks like but that's what i would love to see within our communities um you know we we do have dv courts we have that discussion within that little piece but there's so much more than our domestic violence courts around our state right we know we only have 13 dv courts right? We have 44 counties and we have how many families? So, I mean, that, that's just my point, which just adds to, to what all of you are saying, I think. And I would agree with what Amber had to say. Amber. I also agree with you, Alfredo. 
I find I've also started working with uh, Bennett County DV courts. I find that really helpful. But my biggest problem is the same as all you guys, time. Uh, so many of our programs are so far apart distance wise. If I go down to Bonneville County from Jefferson County to attend a meeting, that's a good for a one hour meeting. That's a good three hours out of my day. I don't have the time to do that. I just don't. It'd be beneficial, yes. So if we proceed as we proceed talking about this, I'd like to see more attention paid to at least Zoom meetings because most of us could find time for an hour Zoom meeting once a week. At least I think I could. But that's the biggest crunch, time. And, you know, I've been doing this for close to 20 years now. And time has always been a problem. And time will always continue to be a problem. So like Amber, I don't know what it's going to look like. I support it. We're willing to discuss it. You know, I think that maybe one of the things that come up, uh, and again, I think the purpose of today is, you know, to open up that conversation. I think this is a starting point, quite frankly. I think there's going to be a lot more discussions that will come from this, I'm hoping, um, you know, as compared to finding solutions today. But, you know, one of the things is kind of structurally, how is it that we're put together? I know for us as an offender intervention program, I'm not aware of any grant dollars that are out there for the kind of work that we do. Um, and so, you know, people who come to our program pay out of their pocket um, and it's not a lucrative business. I'm not here to, you know, make a lot of money. That's not the, the purpose of the work and uh, nor is it viewed in that way. Um, and so, you know, I agree with, you know, Scott, it, it is a barrier. Uh, you know, we're the janitor, uh, we're the IT, we're the group facilitator, we're the program director, uh, you know, we're the flower and plant keepers, right? We're all of those things. And so structurally, right, do we need to rethink, well, how is it that we're put together? Um, and is there a way to kind of rethink how structurally uh, we're doing these kinds of programs? I think what Tricia said earlier and her colleague uh, Kimberly had mentioned in a previous uh, meeting is that we have these individuals who have multiple responsibilities placed upon them, right? So they have to go drug test, uh, which is another part of the community. They have to go do parenting classes, which is another part of the community. They have to do offender intervention program, another part of the community. Uh, they have to meet with their PO, which is another part of the community. So they have all these responsibilities that are placed on them um, and it becomes very difficult. Structurally, is there a way that we can kind of rethink this um, in regards to how we're kind of put together so that we are able to have a little bit more time and support in regards to what we're doing. I think, and I'm really curious um, about this, but I think most programs are probably like mine in that they're small staffed. Um, and, you know, if one person gets sick, the other person is screwed for two weeks as they're making up the groups uh, for that other individual. Um, and so, yeah, how do we, you know, how do we start thinking maybe outside the box um, and again, working more upstream in regards to, uh, I think our community, we have the back end copy. We have systems and programs in place. If someone offends, they go to the court systems and then they're told to do programs. We have that covered. But I really, really want to start working more upstream to say, how can I get to you before you ever have to come in my program? Which is what Lister uh, has been able to do with Men Stopping Violence. They're more volunteer as compared to, as I understand it, a lot of people coming in on a volunteer basis, um, the community and, and men being able to recognize their need for these things and coming in as compared to waiting for uh, the court order to come through and being made to come into programs like ours. Let me check in on something. And this is this would have been helpful to have asked this earlier. It sounds like the offender intervention programs in Idaho have a confidentiality clause. Is that correct? Am I hearing that right? I heard. Okay, so I think that 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 ha I think has some serious implications. So, for example, here in Georgia, the Georgia Commission on Family Violence, which is the regulatory body for all intervention programs in Georgia, um, they certify the program and so on and so on. There's a no confidentiality clause, so programs don't have confidentiality. I mean, just to be redundant. And I think what that allows for is more community engagement. Our analysis is that this is not a problem of individual men going astray. This is a societal problem, right? Based in a whole lot of structural inequality, 
and so on and so on and so on. And so the solution have to be community centered. It can't be about just fixing quote unquote individual men. This is the community problem. So the community needs to be as engaged as possible in the solutions because let's face it, only a handful of men who are committing acts of violence against women um, will ever see a, a offender intervention program. I mean, I don't know of any empirical study, you know, to that asserts a, an exact number of a percentage of such men, but we know it's small. Some speculators lower, you know, 5%, maybe 10% of men ever will show up in any kind of treatment. And so if that is true, the men who are getting away with it, what message are they getting? They need to get a message that, you know, it, you know that it's unacceptable and there are gonna be serious consequences. So engage in the community in the solution as much as possible. For, so for example, anybody can come and observe an offender intervention program class group at any time. Just basically call the instructors. We want to check out because we are accountable to the community. There's no privatization because we believe the more privatized violence against women is, the more likely the problem is going to thrive. This is not to be privatized. This is a crime against the community and the community needs to be involved. So it makes it easier to have the kind of coordination um, and the kind of solutions that um, I think we're, we're, we're discussing. We have Domestic Violence Task Force. That's a place where all the different um, constituencies within the community come together on a regular basis, doing some problem solving, talking about what is going on. So that kind of coordinated community response is happening at those task force meetings. All the players, the courts, the offender intervention program, advocacy program, are at that meeting on a regular basis. And one last thing too, I think that has a built-in opportunity to bridge the gap, the tension between offender intervention program and women serving organizations is that the state of Georgia required every intervention program to have a victim liaison. Okay, it's a given and it had to be from a shelter or other women serving organizations. And so when a man enters the program, we are in touch with the, 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 the advocacy program, the victim service organization, sending a report to them. John so-and-so just entered the program. That alerts her to reach out to John's partner to see if she is in need of any particular services, you know, you know confidentiality, confidentially. So that's a built-in engagement between advocacy program and offender intervention program that we are having weekly contact because of that provision in the state of Georgia that every offender intervention program must have a victim liaison. And any movement when he enters the program, if he's suspended from the program, if he finishes the program, advocacy knows that. They can engage his partner about the implications of those changes for her safety. That's, that's I think, has really, really made a difference. So there's no months going and we're not engaged. This is a weekly ongoing partnership conversations, working together, you know, to create safer communities. Thank you. I appreciate that knowing that that is possible and that it is Georgia has made to that those built in processes so that it is is as followed as a muscle that you all do, like you said, on a weekly basis, you Lester. Um, Trisha, if you don't mind, I'd love to put your voice in the room too about ways that you are connected and how you and who you are connected. Now I'm not asking you to give up cell phone email numbers, but <laughs> like the physicians of, of people who you have built and from your advocacy base. Um, definitely. And I, when he, when uh, we were talking about DV court earlier, I know when Canyon County had DV court, um, we did have our court coordinator was on the DV court team. And I know that that, that provided her a lot of insight um, as to what was going on. And also I think was easier for um, the offender intervention programs to have a really, uh, a direct line to a victim advocate for the partner of whoever was in the class. So I think we had a lot of different things built into that. Um, when DV court was happening. It's no longer happening in Canyon County, um, but I, I think that that piece is definitely missing. And I know that Amber knows that that uh, was, uh, was working when it was here. So, um, which is too bad. But I think, um, you know, one of the things we, we at least at for Hope Store learned early on with 
programs and it was when we had families coming um, with multiple service providers attached to that family, whether it was the guardian ad litems, um, child protection, foster care, probation and parole, whoever that was, was that it's really stressful to move into the shelter anyway. Um, and when you come with so many other um, uh, things going on, and we used we we talked to the gals at the shelter about, you know, you have a platter that's this big, and then every we're gonna put everybody's stuff on top, and it's already overflowing before you move into a domestic violence shelter. Um, so we decided early on that um, reaching out to some of the people. Uh, involved in each one of those cases or each one of those family units um, was going to be the easiest for everybody to be successful. So we made those connections with probation and parole. It was kind of a different um, relationship, but we had the people that we could call directly. We made um, those connections with foster care, um, child protection, Treatment providers is a huge one, mental health providers. And again, it just comes back to talking to everybody and finding out what's best for that family. You know, if we have people trying to get their kids back, they also want to be back as a family unit. You know, they've lost their housing, they all these different things. It only made sense that we're all working towards the same goal. You know, again, um, if we're all working and giving them the same information and the same support, and we're all talking. So if I had a question, like something didn't make sense, I could easily, I had those releases signed. I could call and say, hey, we're working on this case plan. What, what, what did you mean by this stable housing? You know, what does that look like? Does that mean they can be in shelter and they can get their kids back? So then they can eventually, you know, all move out and, and have their own home. But it was just having those conversations and building those relationships that you you trusted that what they were giving you was the right information and, and, and you know, vice versa, that they could trust that when we say that we're gonna have, you know, this space for them to have their kids back, we have that space for them. It wasn't a question that, oh, they're living in a shelter, so they're gonna be gone all day and nobody's gonna know anything. But just again, really having those conversations um, and having those with the families too, sitting down with, you know, the, the mom that's moving into the shelter, that's trying to get her kids back, that's in, you know, substance abuse treatment and on probation for whatever, sit down with her and have those conversations and say, you know, we want you to have your kids back. We want your family unit to get all of the services and those wraparound. So let's all be on the same page. You know, it doesn't do any good for us to be secretly doing this over here when child protection is asking this and um, uh, the guardian ad litem is wanting this and it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and you're not going to get anywhere. You're just on a hamster wheel that you can't get off of. You know, it's kind of like when we ask people to go uh, down to the Department of uh the DMV to get a driver's license. We can't get a driver's license without a social security card. Can't get a social security card without a birth certificate. Can't get a birth certificate without a driver's license. So it's like this, we're asking people to perform a miracle that they can't perform. And so again, I think, you know, just communicating and not just putting it all out on the table. Like this, this is the reality. Kind of, you know, what you Lester said about he's in batters or intervention. Oh, great. Now he's dropped out. You know, that's something that you need to know for a safety plan. You know, if you have it set up that he's there and then he's dropped out, the safety plan might need to be adjusted. You know, things need to be looked at again. But if we all are just in our little silo and nobody's communicating, you know, I, I think that what we, we really can't provide the best service to families. You know, definitely we have to put safety first and, and make sure that all of those things are in place, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to communicate with the people that are also supporting that family. So, 
uh, kind of on a related note coming through, there's a question, is it all right if I ask that of you panelists? <laughs> okay, there are some questions and then and a conversation in the chat about trust, both as an advocate and an offender intervention treatment provider. Um, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but can you talk more about how you build up trust to be able to have the conversations that you are allowed to have that would support families? I noticed that in the chat as well, and I wanted to kind of talk about that, right? Uh, and this is, uh, you know, um, plus oneing what you Lister said, right? Is having that tough conversation. Uh, and I don't think that, I, for me anyway, I don't think that I have to be um, completely uh, free of non-trust. I, I think there's, I think that tension um, is, going to be there. And I, and I think it's actually a, a good thing uh, that some tension is there, right? Um, but I think it's being able to trust that we can be in that space regardless of that tension, right? That we will be able to be of support to one another um, and to, you know, really work to, you know, help each other out. Um, but just know that we're able to have that tough conversation um, about, hey, this is kind of what I feel or this is what's coming up for me. Um, you know, I, I wonder all the time, man, are we doing a good enough job um, if, if, if people were to come in like Trisha or someone else, right, would we be doing, or, or Mrs. Alma Ortega, right, that I see on my screen, you know, if they were to come in and see this you know, um, are we on path? Are we doing things uh, as you would kind of hope or maybe expect or, you know, what thoughts came to your mind as you saw this kind of a thing and be able to engage in that discussion. But uh, until we're in the room uh, and we're able to have these kinds of discussions, it will be hard to know uh, where we're at. And I think that that's something that we might need to, um, you know, address sooner rather than later, just having these conversations. You know, and then I, I think about the question of what is the source of the distrust? Or, you know, what are the source of our sources? Just really get into the heart of the matter again, getting into the room, the willingness and safety and other factors that would help for, that would contribute to a healthy conversation. But I think, again, my bias is we have to go there. We had to go there. And we are continually going there, you know, working with, um, with uh, women serving you know, agencies. The reality is, at least the way we see it, the problem of male violence against women is grounded in structural inequality, in sexism, in patriarchy. And so then you have women serving organizations and male serving organizations. We've got to name that. I think you have to head on dealing with gender. And there's a tension there and a difficulty really going there. But to me, until we went there here in Atlanta metro area, we weren't able to build a strong, we have a strong working relationship with all of the agencies in the Metro Atlanta area because we name that reality, you know, because what one of the things that comes with it is the willingness, at least from my position as a male identified person, the absolute willingness to listen to women. And that's not a natural reflective, reflexive, you know, a me response in a sexist world. It's just that what women have to say in sexism doesn't matter as much. And the idea of listening to women and women leadership, a lot of men really struggle with that. That's one of the tensions. And so to me, getting in the room as a man, I have been clear from guidance from Kathleen Carlin again, our executive director, you know, that um, that is a prerequisite for, for the work. Men have to be willing to just be uncomfortable, listen to some difficult mm -hmm. truths, as women experience and, and learn from it. So I think I have to go there. <laughs> and maybe that may require like out, outside facilitation, like somebody who is not involved, you know, in the work to come together in the room and have some real, you know, head on. What is the mistrust based in? What are the concerns on both sides? Let's deal with it. Let's name it and have listening be the primary outcome, not argument back and forth. Well, that's not how I see it. That's not just real deep listening. Let me hear, let me tell you what I'm hearing. 
the good old mirror, right? What I'm hearing is that, and that's it. It's come out of that first one is, whoa, I'm hearing a perspective that I may not I have thought about, didn't know, and that is the goal. And then you can build on that. But I don't think that tension is going to go away and that distrust until we get to the, the heart of the matter, at least. And I don't want to make an assumption either. Uh, so I want to kind of piggyback on what uh, Lister is saying there. Again, my experience eight years ago, when I came into this work and attended that first conference and saw my colleague and was excited about, you know, a new career and, and it was purposeful work, right? I was really glad to be doing that work. It meant something to me personally, my own personal life uh, and the things I had to address about, you know, my views as a man and, and what that meant in my relationship and the ways that I wasn't showing up in my relationships, right? So really excited about that work and to be told by a colleague, oh, you're one of them, right? Uh, you're working to make offenders better uh, was, was the exact quote. And so maybe things have changed, right? Um, and if they have, I'm really curious to hear about that. But if they haven't, then you list what you're saying becomes even that much more important to say, well, you all that can exist. You know, how do we how do we kind of gather and, and have this discussion and conversation so that we're able to you know move forward? But, um, you know, I hope that we recognize uh, that we are trying to accomplish the same things. And uh, how can we be of support to one another in that effort of trying to do that? One other thing, let me give you a raw example, as I've heard it from some some um, advocates. There's still, Thanks, Gabriel. there's still, I don't know how many, what percentage is still um, the view out there by some, perhaps many, that, for example, men don't and can't change, right? Let's just take that as that view is out there. It's like, oh, you're one of the, oh, you're just out there doing that work, wasting your time, right? Point of view, men don't, don't ain't going to change. So if I am an advocate with that view, view, right? That will inform my engagement and the way I think about the program. So that's a, an example that may not even, I don't know if you ever heard that directly, Alfredo, but it's out there. It's a waste of time. These offender intervention program men don't change. What is the point of you all doing that? That's not going to enhance victim safety. We've got women got to look out for themselves, do their work, do the best they can and not count on men changing. We're going to get disappointed again. That's out there still. Amy, I think we need to shine light. And so I appreciate the chat conversation one and two also the, this conversation which you all are naming. So right now going into the chat is, is, is maybe practice for us. From your role, what does anything make you hesitant to partner with an advocacy program or community offender intervention program? Um, and if you'd be comfortable, please put it in the chat. We are nearing our time. But you know, to Lester's point, um, we, we, we can. Th these things are possible, and we do know. And I would also encourage you to to, to reach out and maybe check out Men Stopping Violence, their website. From the benefit that I've had in engaging men's work here in the state of Idaho through the Idaho Coalition, I got time to be with them in person. But the one value that continues to show up in my work is quote unquote, we are the work. And I take we to mean men, me, cis, hetero, able-bodied men. We are the work. And so I've heard a lot of chat and I've written about being in a relationship and, and it's very grassroots form. You know, Trisha shared with us the multiple partners that she's able to through advocacy work. But I think the beauty of having you, Lester, knowing that it is possible and what Men Stopping Violence has done and continues to do. Um, so that'd be an invitation to you all as partners uh, participants in this. Um, so thank you. Some, some responses are coming in to some of our hesitations. Um, you know, and you, Lester, we had, had prepped some time at the end and thankfully, you know, you all have been, been providing us with education and knowledge, but we did want to leave a little bit about maybe the story of Men's Stopping Violence, I believe, but you have named some things from early throughout, but were there any other points that you had wanted to make um, about the journey that you have been a part of with Men's Stopping Violence? Um, and maybe share out with us in Idaho around the relationship development or how your participants are coming to your program. Sure, I, I've integrated a lot of those in my responses, but just to add and maybe reiterate a couple of points before we go. Um, our program 
about 50% of the men who come to our intervention program are not sent there by the court. But very few men we believe are there voluntarily. It's usually partner referred or some perceived loss. Like if I don't go, this is going to happen. So we're running about 50-50. And, um, but historically most of the men, yeah, are not court, court ordered. Um, and because we go beyond the court, our belief is that if we're gonna end violence against women, we got to just see the court as one aspect, an important aspect of the response to, 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 to domestic violence. Got to get community at all levels engaged. So we do a lot of work outside of the intervention program, bringing community into the mix. We have a model called the Community Accountability Model, which you can find on our website, which really gets into you know, the weeds of a community-based solution. We do not see intervention program as the fixed all go all. It is a small part of the work. As a matter of fact, we use it more as an organizing tool. Again, you hear the theme to engage communities, bring communities into the mix to be, to be part of the solution. And for us, again, one of our core values, Jeff talking about our work, is um, our intervention program, our work we do with men, with men must be informed by the voices of women. If we're working apparently in the interest of women and girls, it makes sense to me that um, women's voices must be central and that we are be accountable to women. And that I think is what makes our program really unique in that way. We are really clear about that. So much of our practice reflect um, that um, women's voices are key to our solutions. Thank you, Elister. So we did put in Men's Topic Violence's uh, website URL into the chat box. So we'd love for you all to explore that. Um, and now you have a personal connection to Lester Douglas, who has been so kind to, to share with us. So we do have a relationship with the state um, with them. I really deeply want to thank our panelists for, for being vulnerable and to share their, their, their thoughts and experiences with all of us. Participation, participants, thank you all for the questions and engaging one another in the conversation chat. Um, and before we dip, I do want to, to name it. There was placed in the, in the chat a survey. If you don't mind clicking on that survey to give us some feedback. Um, that will also inform the, the hosts of this conference, the Idaho Council on Domestic Violence, about for some of these further suggestions that you all had, had, had provided. Uh, we certainly know time is a resource we cannot reproduce. Um, however, if there is an interest in a will, there may be some follow-up, and then we may be able to provide those spaces for us. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over um, to Annie, if there's anything we need to end on. I don't think so. I think uh, just the council would appreciate you completing your survey. And thank a you so quick much. Thing. Um, so Amber Moe has um, a session at 145 that I think actually piggybacks on this a little bit uh, in regards to how we connect, right? And so her uh, breakout session is Effective Strategies for DV Offender Intervention Programs and DV Evaluators when contacting and interviewing victims of domestic violence. So again, it's just like, how can we engage in these other entities in a much better way than what we are now. And so that could lend also to the conversation, some of the talk, uh, topics we talked about today, because what you Lester said, uh, I think really rings true for me. Uh, we have to be informed by uh, the voices of women in our communities um, and to better understand and take that to heart in regards to how that applies to the work that we're trying to do. Um, and then to just address a question that you Lester had um, I do believe people are capable of change. I understand not everybody does, right? Um, but this notion of neuroplasticity uh, and the way that we're built uh, suggests that we very much are capable of change. Do we have the will, the community support uh, to make that uh, come forth and, and be true? I appreciate you very much, uh, you Lester and Trisha for taking the time to be with us um, and, and Trisha not feeling well and stepping up to the plate anyway, right? Yeah, thank you. Love to lift up that you Lester is doing a session tomorrow along with the Amber session as well. So check out your agenda, continue all, thank you all for the work that you were doing. Um, and hope everybody continues to be safe and well and in service to our communities. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you. you.